Good afternoon and welcome to Deep in Scripture. This is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program, <clears throat> coming to you from the studios at the Coming Home Network International. And uh, I'm going to announce up front that we're coming to you in the first week of Advent. And I know some of you may hear this program in the future, but in some sense, it's because of when this program is being taped that has shaped the subject matter for the program and has shaped the reason that I've invited my particular guest to join us on the program. I am very excited to say that my guest today is a good friend, Steve Wood. And I want to say he's a lifelong friend, but uh, we, we were ships passing in the night when we were in seminary together. Uh, and I mainly have come to know Steve because we're both converts to the Catholic Church, and we share so much. But I'll mention in a moment why I've invited Steve. But first of all, Steve, welcome to the program. Thank you, Marcus. Very good to be here. It's great to have you. You've been on the program before. Um, I want to make sure I get to tell the audience just briefly what you what you do, what you've done since coming into the church. Well, I have worked really to strengthen the sanctity of the marriage bond, the sanctity of life through the family, basically strengthening Catholic families with a particular focus on fathers, because I believe fathers are very uh, critical for the welfare and leadership of the family. And uh, recently, just past few years, started a radio broadcast by the name of Luke 21 Radio, that focuses on topics like what we're going to be discussing today. Yeah, and in many ways, I've got to tell the audience, <clears throat> I've been listening to uh, Steve's Luke 21 radio podcast uh, religiously ever since he started it, and I, I found it fascinating. It, in many ways, comes out of Steve's background, right? I mean, you, you're, because of the um, particular tradition that you came from, Steve, your Protestant tradition um, really drew you in a way to have this great interest in, in explaining in clearly the biblical prophecies and how they apply to our lives. Well, I was stunned as I grew up in a mainline Protestant church, and we said to Creed each week, he will come again. I didn't have the slightest realization that behind that was probably the most significant event yet to ha occur in human history. And uh, I had a conversion experience while in the service, found my way out to a very large Jesus Movement church uh, out in California, and it was, of course, very much into the rapture in any moment theory and such. But I think you have to give credit where credit is due. For the first time in my life, I encountered real living human yeah. beings who believed in the utter reality of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I personally found it just amazing. I was shocked. Why didn't anybody ever tell me this? Why did I, I went to catechism class, went to Sunday school, attended church with my families until about mid high school. I just, just yeah. didn't get it. And so um, that actually set an adventure, really, to try to understand it. I didn't quite see how the pieces fit together for the way I was being taught. And so it was a long pilgrimage uh, to try to figure out what's going on. <laughs> I basically, as a Protestant pastor, came to the Catholic position on biblical prophecy before I became a Catholic. And then I was kind of waiting for somebody to step up to the plate and try to explain this in a simple way to folks. I didn't see it. So uh, hence... Uh, the adventure of Luke 21 radio. You know, <clears throat> um, I certainly didn't end up as deep into biblical prophecy as a Protestant as you did, but I have to admit that it was a similar, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, impact on my life because I was brought up a nominal Lutheran. I knew a whole, knew the faith. I wasn't active. And, <clears throat> but when I had my adult awakening to Jesus Christ, when I was 21 years old in college, um, and this would have been in the uh, early 70s, um, as I was growing in that faith, a, a book fell into my hand called The Late Great Planet Earth. And for the first time, I was awakened to all these things that had never been brought up in my life, even my Lutheran upbringing, which would have had Advent 
and all those yeah. verses read, but there was they were never mentioned. It was a part of the creed. It was, in other words, yes, Jesus is coming again someday, way ahead. It's in generations ahead, so you don't need to worry a bit about it. But uh, that movement which you were a part of affected me to look at those scriptures, and something struck me through all of it. Maybe this is the thing that most hit me, which I believe is still and very important. And that is our Lord and every single New Testament writer emphasized the urgency of being ready. Period. I mean, that's there in all the teach all the parables of our Lord. Uh, we could spend hours going through the parables of our Lord, Paul's understanding of the second coming, the immediacy of it, this age we live in, First Peter, um, the Thess- they're all there. It's there. They all anticipated that the Lord would come soon, Maranatha. The problem is, and this is where I got into it, Steve, is that the assumption I ran into at seminary and so often is, <clears throat> well, they were wrong. They were obviously wrong. They thought he was coming soon, and he didn't. They were wrong. Um, it's We're not to know the day or the hour, so don't worry about it. Plus, look at all the guys that have said they knew when he was coming, and they didn't. Like the dude, remember, in 88 Reasons Why He's Coming in 88. We remember. Yes, so there's when, a whole string of people like, they're still out there. Right. So when you have that, then it just says, well, then don't even worry about it. I mean, no one's supposed to know. And then we have the new group, which I didn't even quite, I wasn't aware of until after I became Catholic. Because here I'm thinking, coming into the Catholic Church, it's all going to be one big unified idea. Well, you come into the church and it ain't one big unified idea. Um, and then there's a whole group of people which you identify in your programs are the, the if you will, the hyper preterists that basically believe that all these things did happen. They all did happen because they all refer to the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. That's what Jesus was talking about. That's what they were all talking about. That's what Revelation was about. And so if there's any already not yet aspect of it, it's way in the future. And it's not really to affect our lives. And, and that's why I just didn't even deal with it on all the years I was a pastor. Every year I would preach one sermon that said, I can guarantee Jesus is coming in your lifetime, either in the clouds or if you died tonight. Mm -hmm. We we can guarantee that. So he's coming. And that's as far as I got. It's there's an urgency. Every our Lord and every New Testament writer talks about this urgency of being ready, be prepared, look at your life. If you can stand before him, could you stand before him without embarrassment? Are you ready for that? But the idea of the second coming or any of these other things, I didn't know where to go with those scriptures. And this is an introduction of our to our program, if I will, because I can't wait, Steve, to get you sharing with us. But uh, as those of you who have listened to the Deep in Scripture program for a while, I'm so grateful to you and, and for your kind words. We've had a we've experimented with a, a variety of genres, if you will. We had the verses you never saw, and Steve, you joined me for. You know, what were the scriptures that brought us into the Catholic Church? There's a genre that we called hard verses, in which we examine passages that that there's all kinds of opinions on. How do you understand them? And then we had a genre of becoming and abiding and abounding, looking at the spirit scriptures that talk about the spiritual life. And more recently, we talked about memorable verses. And those are verses that Steve, I've not had you on that program yet, but verses that we've memorized that because they're so deeply important to us, and and we could go through a list of those. But I'm introducing a new genre, if you will, and I'm calling it key and important essential verses. They could qualify as hard verses because there's so many opinions, but my point is just because they're hard, we mustn't avoid them. They're very important. And in fact, during the Sundays of Advent, many of the readings will be these important verses, but too often they're ignored. 
In fact, there are some of these really important verses that have been left out of the lectionary, and I don't know why, but we might talk about that. So we're going to inaugurate this key important verses series. Steve, you're my first um, victim, uh, if you will. And what I thought we'd do is we would follow the format of the memorable verses, and uh, and that's just kind of fun. So I've got a verse I'm going to share with you, and then you've got one you're going to share with me, and I don't know what they are. And then in the end, we'll see how they fit together. And I can guarantee, audience, that I know this is supposed to be deep in Scripture, but at least the Scripture passage I'm mentioning, I, I'm doing nothing more than skim the surface because it is a hard verse, but I think an important verse. And and I, I will say that I mentioned to Steve that because this is Advent, I wanted us to look at verses that deal with this idea of the approach of the the second coming of our of our Lord, what we proclaim every Sunday in the Creed. And in fact, I want before I go on, Steve, I can't remember if it was before the program we talked about or during the program we talked about, but that very idea of saying this over and over and over in the Creed and yet ignoring it was in some ways what gnawed at you. Yes, and, and it still does, because to be quite honest, one of the reasons I started this Luke 21 radio wasn't because I was sitting around, didn't have anything to do, <laughs> but it, it strikes me that the vast majority of Catholics today are living just like I was living as a mainline Protestant, saying the creed had kind of a nebulous idea that Christ would come again, but as you articulated, it's nothing that's going to impact my life. It's either way in the past or way in the future. Don't worry. Be happy. Go about your life. And that's exactly what the reading was this past Sunday, yep. as in the days of Noah. Now, there's a lot of things going on back there, but it just says they're eating and drinking, marrying. Get, there's nothing wrong with that. They're just caught up yep. in daily life, and they were clueless as to what was coming. And so that's a real passion of mine in the sense that I don't think our eyes are open to these scriptures. And I'm going to jump way ahead because we're <laughs> supposed to have practical application. That's good. But Psalm 119, verse 18, open my eyes, Lord, that I might behold wondrous things out of thy law. And if anybody can hear this, it's just when we're done, just to say a simple prayer, open my eyes, Lord, to these scripture verses during Advent. And that will could oh. literally revolutionize your life. Our lives. I, I couldn't agree more, Steve, and I'm glad you said that. Because uh, on the one hand, I certainly don't want to, uh, on air, be critical of, of our homilists on Sunday. But it's a, it's a hard job to be a homilist today. But, um, but the one thing we will say is that the church has put before us important verses for us to hear. And as you said, Steve, we've got to hear. And maybe... In the time we're living, it's important that we hear. The one thing I can say, at least in my lifetime, and then in my reading of history, I can't remember a time in the history of the church or the world where things are moving, in so many things are moving in the wrong direction so quickly, in ways that, short of grace, I don't see how they can turn around. It's crazy. What does that mean? How do we live our lives? How do we interpret the times as our Lord Jesus says? Right? He says. It's not about figuring out the day or the hour, but you interpret the times so you can examine your lives to be ready, to be prepared. Well, you know, this is a really key point because throughout history, there's been many times the Catholic Church looks like it was in the tomb and it was sealed and nothing was going to happen. Yep. And just like Christ surprisingly came back from the dead, the Catholic Church seems to resurrect. God sends key people at key times, brings renewal, uh, genuine reformation and such like that. But And there's a lot of people, faithful Catholics, talking about that, but I don't hear it mentioned that there's one point in history— where it doesn't go from bad 
to good, but it goes from bad to worse to incredibly horrible. And of course, that's some of the scriptures we're going to be talking about. That's right. If you take the whole scriptures, Steve, they're amazingly, you know, we talk about history of the church. People have often said every 500 years, the church is right. almost on its death bell, death, you know, on, the, on death's door. And then through faithful martyrs, faithful witnesses, God relents, if you will, and then there's new life. And a good example of that is exactly halfway through the church's history so far, we have St. Francis of Assisi. And, and it's as if the church got a new lease on life. And we see this happening all through the saints in their prayers. But if you look at Scripture in that way, there are a number of these times. There's, there's uh, the, how, many, how many thousands of years was it leading up to the flood? You know, Scripture didn't sound very long, but that was a long time. You know, they had the technology mm -hmm. to do what they did, and it had gone so far downhill, as we had in the last Sunday Scripture, that the Lord starts over. And then we have, even though it only covers a, a chapter in Genesis 11, it was probably a long, long period of time before men developed the technology now to build big buildings. And what does the Lord do? He divides everybody up at, at uh, Babel. And then we have the long period of history that leads to loss in Egypt. And here comes Noah, or here comes Moses. And then we have, if you will, from David all the way and the falling of the Davidic kingdom to the second coming of Christ. All of those, in a way, are all types of the time we're living in from the incarnation of Jesus Christ until his second coming. And I believe that if the people were punished by the flood, and the people were punished by the divisions at Babel, and the people were punished by loss of slavery into Egypt, and if the people were punished, and then, of course, you have the coming of our Lord Jesus after that long time. The church, even more so, because we have grace. Mm -hmm. We have so much more in this age of the church than any before us ever had which is why these scriptures we're looking at are so serious. Because to him who is given much, much is required. And that's us in the church. Mm -hmm. And if we've entered into a time of apostasy, we can't point fingers anywhere except at ourselves. Have we lived out the faith? Are we ready? Are we living it out? That being said, my friend, I'm going to drop on you a verse that no one in the history of the church has ever understood until I'm sharing its meaning now. Before I <laughs> <laughs> Whoever's listening should probably hang up now. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll know that I'm complete tongue-in-cheek because the verse that I'm going to share is so difficult that it's not even – covered in the catechism. I don't know if you notice this, Stephen. You go look in the back and you see all these verses, all these apocalyptic verses are there, but this one isn't even touched because it's tough. It is tough. And in some sense, it's so tough because I'm also pulling it out of the context of the whole book of Revelation, which is not fair. It really needs to be in the whole story. And if you want to hear the whole story, what I want the audience to do is to go listen to Luke 21, Steve's broadcast, and it's, it's really worth doing. But here's my verse. Luke Revelation 20, verse 1 through 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it and sealed it over him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be loosed for a little while. Now, everybody, um, is this one of those verses that I want you to memorize? Eh, probably not, but I want you to know where it is because it, it, this is an important verse. But if you've listened to it as I read it, Many of you will realize, yeah, there's a lot of opinions out there on what this means. The whole rapture idea, the 
the, the whole dispensationalist ideal have different views on this. The whole church is divided. I mean, Christianity is divided over interpretation of what those thousand years are. Is it in the future? Is it in the past? Is it now? What does it mean? How does it relate to the second coming? And, and I can tell you that it's because of the difficulty of this passage, I stayed away from it. I'm not going to spend my little moment here before I invite you, Steve, to join me to give the complete background to it. But I'm going to share what I've come to see as the most clear, longstanding interpretation of this and why it's important. And basically, and Steve, I, I want, or maybe I should let you jump in whenever you want, that the, I never saw it this way before, Steve. It never even crossed my mind to see that the thousand years talked about here are not in the future, they're not in the past, but it's now. It's now. That's why we need eyes to see. Yep. It's now. Yes. We're living in this time. And, um, in fact, I have in front of me one of my beautiful, my most famous favorite treasures, and it's a, a copy of the Dewey Reams Catholic Bible that was printed in 1840 in Philadelphia. Um, and it has a footnote on this passage. And it says in the footnote, the power of Satan has been very much limited by the passion of Christ for a thousand years. That is, for the whole time of the New Testament, but especially from the time of the destruction of Babylon or pagan Rome till the new efforts, efforts of Gog and Magog against the church towards the end of the world, during which time the souls of the martyrs and saints live and reign with Christ in heaven in the first resurrection, which is that of the soul to the life of glory, as the second resurrection will be that of the body at the day of the general judgment. In other words, this period of a thousand years begins with, some have said, the incarnation. I think some have, have said the time leading up to the incarnation, you know, preparing the world for the incarnation, that we have this binding of Satan, uh, if you will, so that light enters into the darkness. And if you will, what it means is that before that binding of Satan, before this time period, Satan was free to deceive the nations, which is why in the Old Testament you have so much darkness in the lives of our Gentiles, not able to hear God. But with the binding of Satan, he's still able to do all kinds of nasty stuff, which we've seen in the last 2,000 years. But he specifically is now bound in his deceiving of the Gentile nations, which all of a sudden, by grace, opens the world to hear the gospel, which in my mind is why, for example, I never had a good explanation for this, Steve. You know, Jesus is proclaiming the Sermon on the Mount. Well, does he, does he presume that his people can hear and respond? Or, or does he presume that he's a bunch of, you know, people before grace, so they can't respond. So he's laying this big thing on them they can't respond to. But this idea says, no, the devil has been bound in the sense of blinding people so light can come into the darkness. So when Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount to those people, by grace, they can respond. That's why the rich and young ruler could respond. That's why the parents of John the Baptist were holy people because they could respond by grace. And so we have this huge age of the church during the time of which he sends everyone forth in the great commission to go make disciples of all nations. Why? Because the devil's been bound, so now the nations can hear. And this is a fulfillment of Isaiah, that the light will come into the darkness, all of this. This is the time we have been living in. The thousand years aren't a literal thousand. They're a long period of time that ref reference to this time. And Steve, if you've said so many times in your broadcast, the bottom line of this is, what is the gospel? The gospel is the lordship of Jesus Christ, that he is Lord now in this kingdom. And that this time, though, as it says in Scripture, 
because of the continued influence of Satan and his horde, though the gospel by grace can be received, that doesn't mean that he isn't there to undercut and to tempt, as every New Testament book warned about, to not be conformed to the world and to, to the devil ro- prowls around, as Peter says. So there'll be this time in which, as script, as the Catechism and other emphasize that during this thousand years will be one of battle and suffering, leading to, as then in verse three, a time when the devil will be released again, to then deceive the nations once again, and that'll be during the time of great apostasy that will lead up to the time of the second coming of Christ. There's no time periods given, but there are recognizable signs of these difficult times. All right, Steve, you correct me. No, you you, you have it. Uh, the, the important thing is that recognizing the darkness was truly a kind of a, what I would call it a semi-authority, been granted Satan because of their willful blindness to keep the Gentile world locked up. And it, that verse three, when it says, and he bound them, shut them up in the pit, that, and that's a purpose clause, for the purpose that he should deceive the nations no more. We we are probably going to be singing hymns this Advent or Christmas. Those who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and Jesus is the light of the world. This made the Great Commission possible. And I'd just like to just hit the main objection to this, and it's always put up, uh, those who are advocating the rapture at any moment says, well, people like you, Marcus, and me, aren't taking the Bible literally uh, because it says a thousand years. It means a thousand years. They say it's not a thousand years. We're saying it's just a long time. Yeah. And we're in the next verse. It says a little while. That's a short time. It's, it's comparative. My response to that, well, I'm looking at the same page, facing page to these verses in my Bible. It's Revelation 19. You literally believe at the second coming, a physical sword is going to be coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. (laughs) And he's going to uh, strike down the name, or is it a metaphor or a symbol showing the power of Christ's word when he speaks? Or let's turn the page to the last couple chapters of Revelation. Do you believe that for all eternity you're going to be living in a gigantic cube? Because the New Jerusalem, the length, the width, and the height are all the same. I mean, it's trying to describe this is enormous. That's that's all it's saying. This is a long time. This is a short time. And um, I must say that this isn't looked at by I'm talking about first person. I studied biblical prophecy intensely for probably 15 years before ever considering the big picture of what you're describing. What is this thousand years? Because bottom line, if you pick up, go to any Protestant or Catholic bookstore, you pick up a commentary in the book of Revelation, you want to find out how all of that commentary plays out, just read these verses and how they comment on it because it will determine almost everything else. And I I need to be very upfront. I didn't come up with this on my own. I knew the scriptures well enough to compare it to a computer program. I had all my data, (laughs) but it was just like, what is it? Ones and zeros in the computer language. And I didn't have a program to put it into until I read St. Augustine's City of God. And just in case people want to know, a great place, because there's so many ill-advised places to turn to study biblical prophecy. St. Augustine's City of God, you can get a hard copy on any big box bookstore. You can get it online, you, you know, Catholic bookstores. But Book 20 basically goes through the whole, just a nice summary of the scriptures that were in the Old Testament, New Testament, but Chapter 6, it says, what is the first resurrection, which you just read? And a little further on in chapter 20, it talks about a second resurrection. And St. Augustine 
it was just like a key that just changed my life. I mean, it, all the data, all of a sudden <laughs> that I had pumped in there for years just fit. And and this is what it is. The, the, the rapture in any moment, people, when they read about, you know, uh, there's this rapture or this resurrection, they assume that that's the rapture. In other words, before Christ comes back, there's going to be some kind of resurrection. And then it speaks of after the thousand years, there's another resurrection. <laughs> and it's a very complicated scheme. But what St. Augustine does, he turns to John 5. And it's a principle of biblical studies. If you're in a confusing or difficult passage of Scripture, and granted, this one is, as you meant, this is one yeah. of the toughest in the whole Bible. Yeah. So what do you look for is a similar passage of Scripture that speaks to the same topic. And in this case, it's not only speaking to the same topic, but it's the same author, and it's often unnoticed, but it's the same subject. And if you go to John chapter 5, which St. Augustine does, this is really the key that will open up what this whole thing means in Revelation chapter 20. Jesus says, And 5 and verse 25, truly, truly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is, present tense, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now, it's very interesting to me, the born again people don't get it. This is being born again. (laughs) This is coming to life. We are all born dead, so to speak, spiritually dead through faith and baptism. We're brought to life in Christ. And Jesus is saying that, you know, he's come to bring life. You don't have to wait till the Messiah comes the second time to have new life. It begins now. So that's what John 5.25, that's the first resurrection. And then he goes in verse 28, don't marvel at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs. Now, these aren't the spiritual dead. If you're in a tomb, you're dead, dead, physically dead. And they will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good, to the resurrection of life. That's the second resurrection. That simple information right now, right there, will, I I can't begin to describe the importance of what he has pointed out here. And this has actually been the prophecy outline, so to speak, for the Catholic Church for 1,500 years. You, you know, Steve, and, and, what, gets no, me about, what gets me about what you're saying is that you and I both come from non-Catholic backgrounds who, you know, I was Lutheran and then also Calvinist because of seminary and then a Presbyterian pastor, but throughout my entire Protestant life, we loved Augustine. Yes. Luther loved Augustine. Calvin loved Augustine. Uh, we quoted Augustine, but obviously we picked and choosed because we ignored what you're talking about. Why is it? It's been there. This isn't a brand. This has been there since the fifth. It's, That's right. You know, this. Right. I, I wish I had the, the the my copy of the uh, Liturgy of the Hours in front of me because in the reading this morning, it's Wednesday. The first week of Advent, I can't remember if it was yesterday or today, it might have been yesterday, but the reading was one of the fathers of the church talking about the three resurrections. The three resurrections. The first resurrection is baptism. Mm-hmm. The second, right. the, 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 the third resurrection is when we stand in judgment. The middle resurrection, I mean, the middle is right now. When, when Christ, we've been made new and alive, and he comes to live within us and bides in our heart. You know, it's we, the point is this is not brand new. This has been around the history of the church. So where are all these other ideas coming from? But when you end up with the Bible alone, apart from the guidance of the church, then we get all these other ideas on how to interpret these difficult passages. Well, I have a theory. <laughs> I don't have the all the answer. The theory is at least I, I know the first half of the theory. There's been too much silence on this, Marcus. Yep. And when there's silence, 
uh, nature and supernature hates a vacuum and something will come and occupy it. I am just going to put out why I think the silence has been there. And that's that last part of verse three that you mentioned where it says that, you know, he won't be deceiving the nations anymore for until the thousand years were ended. Well, that's good news. The world yep. changed with Jesus Christ. And if you study true history, which is, you know, just a PS for me, Interpreting the Bible isn't as radical becoming a Catholic as reading history books. It's kind of like, which planet am I reading about here? But in any case— well, but Hold that thought. I was going to say, with you, right. what you said, Steve, no, with what you said, because of what you've just said is why we feel confident that we can go out and proclaim the gospel. Because yes. we believed that the, that the devil's been bound in such a way that our neighbors and our family members in the most lost can hear— because God has given sufficient grace to everyone to hear. Now we just got to tell. And that's because yeah. of the binding of Satan for the thousand years. Well, then it comes to, after that, he must be loosed for a little while. Now, in Greek, the word bound and the word loosed are antonyms. So if Satan is bound so that he can't deceive, and then for a little time at the end, he's loosed so that he can deceive the same nations that were formerly pagan. And it's, this is what is called uh, formerly the great apostasy. And it's the most sobering thing of all the Bible. This, 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 because it means to apostatize as you know, is to fall away from something. So this isn't talking about the radical new atheists who don't have any faith. You have to have something to apostatize from. And you're talking about the Christian world turning their back on the light of the world. Yep. We teach, we say, well, there's the four last things, tell kids, but those are those are just four outline points. And the great apostasy doesn't even fit in. You know what I'm saying? The yeah. kids aren't taught, and adults aren't taught that. And the key scripture, this is kind of my time to vent. Okay, because this, this is I, the verse you're going to share for today, right? Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you, I, when I found this out, um, I literally couldn't sit at my desk. I paced my whole office. I couldn't sit down. And its reason is this. I'm talking about a set of verses in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is the key chapter for the great apostasy. Something in the Thessalonians didn't understand about the second coming. They thought it might have already occurred or something. And he says, no, before Christ returns, something else unmistakable has to take place first, this great falling away. And this is why Jesus continually warns, yep. like the days of Noah. Uh, they were just going about their life doing, well, they were doing a lot of wrong, but the things that mentioned in the scriptures last Sunday weren't wrong. Eating, that's that's a God-given right, and marrying and giving in marriage, that's a good thing. But they were lost because they didn't know what time it was. And here's what gets me. I mean, really, really gets me. This key passage about the great apostasy is never heard in the Catholic Church in the United States. It's not in the lectionary. And not only that, it's, it's cut. The lectionary is cut at verse 3 through the first half of the verse. It talks about uh, don't be disturbed by a letter purporting to be from us that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come. And then period. That's what you hear in Mass. That's directly opposite from what St. Paul is saying. Yeah. That's like, don't get wound up about the second coming, because the last half of that verse says, unless the rebellion and the apostasy, or the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. We don't hear it. It, and so going back to Revelation, 
verse 3, chapter 20, verse 3, that he's loosed. Yeah. So he can loose in order to deceive. And Jesus is always warning us. And in fact, the whole Bible is like a big warning sign about falling into error. And the key chapter, chapter 2 of Second Thessalonians, is zipped. And you can't tell me that you take half a verse and zip the part out about the great apostasy and the Antichrist at a time in history, and who knows? Uh, you know, we don't set dates, we don't. But as you said, the world, the modern world, including formerly Christian nations, with an intensity and speed are falling away, the like of which um, I, I'm not aware of, the, the speed of which. So I think it's very serious that we are living in a time where this isn't spoken of. Right. And then to kind of bring back what you mentioned, okay, we have a lot of good folks who love the Bible, who believe in the rapture in any moment theory, who says, wow, this is so serious. I'm glad I'm not going to be here. They are. Yeah. Okay. And then we have a lot of Catholic folks, including professional apologists, will say, don't worry. That's all past. You don't, that, you're not going to be here. And all of these things are here because at some point in history, those who are faithful to Jesus Christ are going to go through the worst period the world has ever seen and are going to be totally unprepared. And if I can just share personally why I am doing Luke 21 radio, I regard myself just as a coach. And if you're going to go into a game and you grossly underestimate your opponent, in this case, there's no opponent. I mean, it's going to be, you know, <laughs> throw the throw the game. You're you're going to quit. You're going to fall away. You're going to be discouraged. The Bible, you know, so I, I never heard this, you know. So, um, I I think these two passages, particularly verse three, when the loosing, and then you have Second Thessalonians, and by you said, uh, you had to go back to a, a 1800s Catholic Bible to get a good comment. And here you never hear it. Yeah, you never hear it, and so. And I don't uh, know. I can't imagine why. You know, I'm not going to look for a conspiracy theory or whatever. Why, when they put together the lectionary, it isn't there? But it troubles me too that this. Maybe they they felt it was just too difficult to explain in the short length in the ten minute homilies that they're allowed on a Sunday that they didn't go there, but. I mean, you and I both know that generally on Sunday, the, the homilist covers the gospel and often ignores the second reading anyway. But then it's almost like it's not even to be heard. But to me, it says in the Catechism, for example, and this is another paragraph, Steve, that I know you emphasize a lot on your Luke 21 program, and that's, you know, 673 and 4 and 5 in the Catechism. Uh, dealing with the glorious advent of Christ and the hope of Israel. But the scriptures say very clearly, I mean, the, the catechism says, that before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. Yes. Yes. That's the catechism. I know. And it talks about further in that same paragraph, the supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist. And let's just say hypothetically, and I am not predicting any dates or anything else, right. but let's just say we are happen to be in this time right now. Just say hypothetically. And we don't have good comments on Revelation 20. We don't have the warning, the explicit warning and description in 2 Thessalonians 2. Don't you think we would be set up for deception? Yeah. I, I mean— and by the way, I need to mention the Catholic catechism, rather than spending your money on a lot of people who, you know, claim to be getting direct messages from God about what's going to happen, the catechism, that section you just mentioned, is priceless. Yeah. And I'll tell you, a, a, a great, if, you know, these are only a few paragraphs starting in 673, 675, I probably mentioned, I don't know, a hundred times already uh, in the last few years. 
if you'll simply go to the footnotes, and in the footnotes, you'll see scripture references. So just open your Bible and take some time, go through the scripture references, and see how the catechism is pulling these together. It took me over 15, almost 20 years to get this, and it's you could do this in a one and a half cups of coffee. Well, what I'm going to ask now, Steve, is let's talk about pulling these verses together, and then what do they practically mean for our lives? And <clears throat> you know, as I've, as I've come to appreciate not this new way of understanding biblical prophecy, though in some ways it's new to me, mm-hmm. it was a discovery that this has been the thread of understanding from the beginning of the history of the church. It's been there to the early church fathers, it's been there in Augustine, it's been there in, I've read a number of commentaries where this has been the understanding. So what's its point? And it does bring us back to the, the scripture that was in Sunday's Mass about in the days of Noah, people were drinking and eating and having a good old time. Those things aren't evil in themselves, but they're, they're not taking our life seriously. It's not taking seriously our standing before God because it's so easy for us to get caught up, caught up in, you know, who's, who's going to win the, uh, the, and double C, the, the football tournament coming up soon. And we get mm-hmm. caught up in all these other things and they're good things, but we get distracted. And part of it is because we think that all these warnings that our Lord gave and the New Testament authors gave and St. Augustine gave and others have given, that's way in the future. That's not going to bother me. It's kind of like right now we have a, 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 a the debt in the United States is going out of this world, but we're not going to have to worry about it, Stephen. That's for our grandkids to worry about. You know, it's, it's in the future. We don't worry about it. And so we, we just keep throwing money in this pit. We keep, it's the future. And we're not going to worry about it. And we feel that way about our lives, about how we That's live right. our lives. It's in the future. It's way in the future. It's not. But the truth is that understanding revelations in this sense means we're living in this time. And when we look at the world around us, we may be in that time of apostasy. In fact, another place where, where uh, Paul writes about it is in um, 2 Timothy, when he describes... Understand this, that in the last days there will come times of stress, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, implacable, slanderous, profligates, fierce, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding the form of religion but denying the power of it. Excuse me, but that's now. Mm -hmm. That is now. And so when we hear this, practically, what are we to do? We should be on our knees. We should be seeking the graces that the Lord gives us through his church and his sacraments. We should be uh, seeking to understand how, Lord, you want me to live out my life, whatever time you've given, whether it's just one more day or 20 more. How do you want me to live? That's the point of this all, isn't it, Steve? It is. And, you know, in the midst of this, I really feel feel for young people in the 21st century because, uh, you know, you and I grew up in a fairly normal world. We saw it kind of go haywire in the 60s and early 70s, and now you just shake your head. You can't even believe what's going on. But just try to imagine, and to me it's unimaginable, if you've never known anything other than abortion on demand. Same-sex marriage, Uh, Christians going to church every week and living in what we call mortal sin without really any pains of conscience. So um, one of the things that I have actually – because I pay attention to the Protestant (laughs) prophecy stuff just to see what's going on. Very interesting that um, there's quite an interest in evangelical young people in biblical prophecy. And I don't know if you've ever seen or read of Sophie Scholl of the White Rose Movement in Nazi Germany. No. 
Uh, if you want to do yourself a favor, it's kind of a rough ending because she literally gets her head cut off by the Nazis. Hmm. But Sophie Scholl and a few other students read St. John Henry Newman's four Advent sermons. And if you want to see how an Advent sermon is done, <laughs> these will get you to confession. And it was actually reading these that caused them to wake up and decide that they were going to oppose Hitler and the Nazi movement, even if it meant their lives. And I can't think, you know, in today's world, you know, everybody, young people want socialism. They want everything, they want abortion and same-sex marriage, whatever. Sophie Scholl was awakened by these Advent sermons. And uh, if you have Amazon Prime, it's Sophie Scholl, The Last Days. There's a movie of her life. Wow. And then... Uh, you can get in paperback form Confederacy of Evil, which is Cardinal Newman's four Advent sermons. Hold that up, Steve. Have you ever read that book? Okay. This? <laughs> oh, look at I read it all the time. I but, just... you know, in here, he mentions St. Cyril. And this is what St. Cyril says. Prepare thyself, O man, when you hear the signs of the Antichrist, and don't remind yourself only but communicate them liberally to all around thee. So I'm giving this book out for stocking stuffers this Christmas. Okay, now here, if you have a child according to the according to the flesh, do not delay to instruct him. If you're a teacher, a catechist, a pastor, whatever, prepare thy spiritual children lest they take the false for the true. In other words, the great deception. And... You know, everybody is trying to figure out, do we dumb down the faith? Do we try to jazz it up? Do we try to do this or that? And uh, I would dare say a solid understanding of biblical prophecy, because even with young people, and this kind of flips back to my family uh, type things, you know, uh, parents and pastors and everyone's concerned with the morality of young people. And so you have sex education, you have uh, chastity conferences and talks. Do you know that a young person's worldview will affect their morality significantly more than what their beliefs are about sexual morality? In other words, and to have a worldview, there's only two things you need, really, really need. Where you came from, my life is not my own, I'm accountable to a creator, and then you need to know what your future is. And with those two things, you begin to get where you are. It's like a, yeah. like a, a, a navigation fix because otherwise this is as in the days of Noah, you're just going to get lost in daily and days of Noah. They didn't have cars to get them and airplanes and internet and smartphones to get them distracted. Uh, and we're hyper distracted and we don't have those two things. We're not giving them to young people. So, um, I'd say give Cardinal Newman's or watch Sophie Scholl with your kids and that not little kids. Cause she literally, they don't show the actual head getting cut off, but you're, you're within about 15 seconds of it in the movie <laughs> and say, what caused that young woman to have such a backbone for what is true? And then say it's Cardinal Newman's four Advent sermons and, Maybe it's worth reading them this Advent. You know, I when I look at the world, I, I do believe it seems that most of the stuff that was warned about is now. But I also recognize that whenever you pick up, especially primary sources of writers at different points in history, you'll see that they looked at their time period and they saw it really dark too. I, I just just recently mm -hmm. we had the. Uh, the feast of St. Francis Xavier and, and in the reading for him, you know, he's talking about how dark it was during his time. He was just begging for anybody in the, in the University of Paris to get out there and help, but it was so dark. But when we, when we recognize that, what we got to, the danger is that we just assume, hey, there have been bad times, it'll just get better. So I'm just going to toughen it down, it'll get better. There'll be a springtime, everything's going to be fine. There's no guarantee of that. And uh, when I look at what Paul says, holding the form of religion but denying the power of it, the truth is that only two out of ten people in the world claim to be Catholic. 
And we also know that of those two out of 10, maybe one goes to mass. So that means out of every 10 people, maybe one person will die in the sacraments. We've got a lot of work to do. That's the point. We've got a lot of work to do. There are a lot of people out there that need to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to know that salvation is through our Lord Jesus Christ and that he gave us church and that through our baptism we become born again and then we we stand before God on how we lived our life. I mean, people need to know that. And I know, Steve, that's at least why I do the work that I do, and I know that's why you do the work that you do. Absolutely. This is what it's about. You know, again, back to the days of Noah, it was a long time uh, that God waited in the days of the building of the ark, and it wasn't that um, he needed the time. He wanted to have mercy to give people time to repent. And what did the people do when they heard Noah? They thought it was a big joke. Uh, that, you know, and we see the same thing today. It's been so long. The only reason it's going on so long is that God wants people to repent, to embrace him, to be faithful to him and be ready for his coming again. And as you mentioned, we all are going to meet Jesus (laughs) pretty soon, either at the end of our lives or he actually comes back to this world and we're to be ready in both cases. Yeah. Today. And as the reading from Sunday was in Romans, and that's true for you and me more than a lot of our viewers, because I look and see, Steve, you got your hair's a little whiter than I remembered it in the past, <laughs> just like mine is too. And that's why Paul said, you know the time, it is the hour now for you to awake from sleep, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed, my friend. Yes. That's the truth of it. Yes. It really is. Steve, before we close, I want you to just one last time remind the audience of where they could connect with you and your wonderful podcast, Luke 21. Yes, you can get a hold of me. I'm My website is dads.org. That's dads.org. And Luke 21 Radio is a podcast. You can get it on Spotify. You can get it on uh, iTunes. And it's free. Uh, we can set it up with your local uh, Catholic radio station at once. And there are Catholic stations uh, doing it. So, uh, and share it with your friends and your children. Do what I said. Watch yeah. Sophie Scholl. And then let's, uh, let's look at four Advent sermons designed to get you into the confession line. All right. Thank you, my friend. And thank all of you for listening to Deep in Scripture. If you have any questions about any of this stuff, please contact us. Whether you want to talk to me or you want to talk to Steve, I'll make sure you get a connection there or you want to connect to the Coming Home Network forum if you got any questions. During this time of Advent, the call is to be ready, to wait, to prepare. And that doesn't mean hide ourselves in a closet. It means to be a, a faithful steward of the gifts we've been given, which is to share the gospel, the full gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks for joining us on Deep in Scripture. Look forward to being with you again next week. Deep in Scripture is a production of the Coming Home Network International. To hear more episodes, view our full archive of written and video conversion stories, participate in our online community forum, and more, visit chnetwork.org. You're also invited to explore free membership in the Coming Home Network and receive support on your own Catholic journey. Again, visit chnetwork.org for more information.